Hello everyone, I'm Leslie Cornwell, Certified Nurse Midwife with Empowering Midwifery Education. This section has to do with general information about labor and childbirth. So the legal disclaimer we put at the beginning of all of our information, it's for educational purposes only, not intended to substitute for professional, legal, or clinical advice. We try to keep our information as accurate and timely as possible, but make no claims and guarantees of the accuracy and updated information. The course objectives, the student will be able to understand why childbirth and labor are important topics to discuss, be able to explain exactly what is labor, the different stages, what happens during the childbirth process, signs of labor, and what are the different stages, first, second, and third, and how we can support families through that. Whether you're a birth assistant, you're a midwife, you're new or experienced into the birth world, it's good to go back to the basics sometimes. So there'll be also course objectives of the delivery options, the different ways that people can give birth, natural versus induction, the pain management options that are available, the natural and the traditional medical ones, what exactly are labor contractions, helping clients be able to understand the timing of contractions, and the subjective and objective feelings that are coming with the contractions, what changes are occurring in the body, and what people are feeling during those changes. So why is labor and childbirth a great conversation just to go back to the basics? Because when we are advocating for normal birth, we really have to understand what is the birth process? What are the stages? What are all the changes with the hormones, the body, the thoughts, the things happening to a woman's body when it is time to birth her child? And it's important to understand, like, how can we comfort them? How can we advocate? How can we know what's normal and warning signs if we don't actually understand the normal birth process. So it's essential for us to really go back to the basics and just say, okay, these are the signs of labor, these are warning signs, these are the stages of labor, this is how we educate families on the stages of labor. And maybe you're new into this birth world and it's great for you to learn the different things, what's early labor, what's active labor, what's transition, what is pushing and birth and normal restitution, all these terms that are commonly used, it's important to have a good understanding of them. So going back to the basics, what is labor? Labor is a series of continuous progressive contractions where the uterus is pushing a baby out, the, the cervix is dilating, it's opening, and then effacement is the thinning of the cervix. So traditionally in the medical culture in the US, we use um, cervical dilation from zero centimeters to being closed, not open yet, to 10 centimeters, meaning there's no cervix left around the baby's head. And then women traditionally will be coached with pushing or they will will naturally, depending on your setting, you're serving, hospital settings, they tend to be more epidurals, they tend to be more coach pushing, more active management of labor. And then in the out of hospital setting, it tends to be more passive, instinctual, listening to the body, not giving as much direction and guidance. So there's two different very philosophies of how to support labor and birth. And my goal is to more emphasize the actual changes that are occurring in the body so you can have a good understanding. Labor is where the baby is actively coming out of the mother through the birth canal. If she ends up in a C-section, it's just a delivery route, but the labor intention, the body doesn't know, the body is trying to get the baby out of the vagina, the birth canal. The labor can start the hormones normal 37 weeks to 42 weeks weeks gestation, they can start making changes in their body up to two weeks before labor actually starts. Some women know, some women don't. We talk about the lightning, the changes, the irritable contractions, those Braxton Hicks practice contractions can get a little more. Water can break before labor starts and that's another sign that things are getting closer. So. There's nothing definitive to say this is the day you're going to have your baby, this is the timing. We can have estimations. She's had three other babies. She always goes to 42 weeks with their other kids. She's more likely to go post dates. If someone has had four babies and always goes around 36, 37 weeks gestation, she tends to be more likely a woman that's going to go sooner. So we can make assumptions, we can make averages, but they surprise you. I've had ladies where it's 42 weeks, then it's 37 weeks. They've had big babies they've had small babies, their labor started with contractions, their labor started with their water breaking, they've had three day labors, they've had three hour labors, like every labor timing and how it flows is different. And that's what we love about 
birth process because it is something that you can't predict how this woman's going to birth. It's so influenced by her culture, her stress, her situation in her family unit, her nutrition, her trauma, her personal beliefs on birth. It's not just the body expressing hormones there's that fight or flight and so it's really important as midwives that we look at the whole mind body spirit with the birth process because I've seen it so many times where they sit at eight centimeters for hours and hours and hours because maybe they had a stillbirth last time maybe the dad isn't there yet maybe the midwife's not there yet the woman can override with her fear with her decision making her mind if the birth's gonna go faster or if it's gonna go slower. So when we're talking in context of this presentation, it's just more focusing on the physiological changes that the body is doing, but knowing that there's so many variables outside of labor that we don't have control over. The daytime, the kids are home, she didn't get good sleep she just fell and now her hips are out of alignment like there's so many variables that can affect the birth process and the baby the baby's position a big baby asynclitic posterior breach versus vertex like there's so many things that can impact the labor process but just to get basics the labor is a process in which the contractions are coming the cervix is opening the mother is pushing out the baby the placenta that supported the baby comes out traditionally after the baby they can deliver in two ways they can deliver vaginally or c-section we're very grateful for our emergency services in our developed countries but I think they do get used over emphasize one in third women do not need a c-section there's a lot of variables that do cause an overuse of cesarean section so most women can deliver healthy vaginal deliveries based on evolution based on our design of our bodies so what is childbirth? Childbirth is a really interesting term because it means a lot of things to a lot of different people. It brings up feelings, it brings up positive, negative, depending on your culture and the discussions. Like maybe some women, this is their first baby, nobody has talked to them about birth. Nobody has talked to them about their body, their menstrual cycle, how you get pregnant, what is growing a baby. Everybody has a wide range of what childbirth means to them. It is the process of labor and birth it's the overall word used to describe predictable events of contractions come the woman births a baby she recovers so it's the overall word that is typically used childbirth education preparing for childbirth it's a very general word from labor all the way to the postpartum recovery process in 2015, there were about 135 million babies born around the world. 15 million were born before 37 weeks gestation, which is preterm labor, and about 3 to 12 percent were born after 42 weeks gestation post date. So most babies do come between 37 to 42 weeks gestation when there's normal, uncomplicated situations arise. In more developed countries, the births tend to occur in a hospital setting. With COVID, it has definitely been shifting. People are looking for more out-of-hospital birth options. It was around 2% of the population before 2020, and now it's more 35 4%. And so the quick doubling of that demand, we may think it's tiny, but when there's such a small community of midwives and birth centers and home birth practices available, it is a huge overload for the practices to support. So we want to definitely empower more birth workers, more midwives, more strong structured practices to support this increased request for out-of-hospital births. What are the different signs of labor? Everyone is different, and this is what's so hard. Some people start with a bloody show, some people start with leaking of fluid, some people start with contractions. I would say most people start with contractions. They could be 20 minutes apart, they could be regular, they could be 10 minutes apart. Some women wake in the middle of the night and they're every two minutes apart. They didn't get any early labor, they just get right into the active every person is different we we give averages we stress to women there's many variations of normal it's the goods and bads of having a baby towards the end i wish i could tell you this is labor there's some things that hint to us that it's more likely labor bloody show a little bit of spotting with wiping means the cervix is thinning it's opening you can do that slowly over time or it could be a shorter amount of time because the contractions are putting the baby's head and pressure on that cervix the progesterone the prostaglandins, all the hormones are ready for birth to happen. 
we don't give enough credit for all the things that have to be together to make labor happen. The baby expresses hormones when their brain and their lungs are ready. They're actually expressing hormones in the body to make labor happen. Our minds, if we're stressed out, we're anxious, we're in a good mental place to say, I'm ready for baby to come now. Like that has a huge influence on the labor process. The uterus has a huge influence with the, the size capacity and the receptor sites because twins tend to come a little earlier because there's a max capacity that each woman's body and uterus can stretch to before they're starting to make some hormones to cause labor and contractions. The cervix expresses hormones. There's so many multifaceted components of labor and I hope we will never be able to figure out the complex labor process because that's one thing that our bodies, this miracle, this amazing process of birthing and growing our babies that the medical world tries to figure out with inductions. Sometimes they can figure it out with an induction by giving some prostaglandins for cervical ripening, giving some synthetic Pitocin by an IV infusion to help encourage a woman to go into labor. But if her body is not ready to go into labor, it's not going to happen no matter what we do. And so those are things to think about when we're trying to decide the best options, if there's medical concerns, the weighing the risk and benefits of an induction, the maturity of the baby, the overall health with the mother versus like normal healthy labor. For first babies, it could be three days, it could be three hours. The average is a 24 hour labor and on average each baby she has, it cuts in half in time, but that's not 100%. So we always try to stress to women, they're pregnant, they're hormonal, they're towards the end, they're wondering if a baby's gonna come. I have put my foot in my mouth so many times because I'd be like, I'm sorry, I think we're going to have our visit in two weeks. Your cervix is closed, thick and high. You're not contracting. I'm sorry. I know you're uncomfortable, but I think we'll have another visit. And then they call me for labor that night because their mind was powerful and everything else. They've had a baby before. It didn't, they had sex. They did all this nipple stimulation. They did all these things to tip the scale themselves and, and they just rub it in my face. And I say, kudos, awesome for you. And then I've seen other directions where I'm like, I think you're going to have a baby any day now. And they're sitting at four centimeters dilated for a month on end. So there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle to make labor start in the labor process. So other signs, we talked about the water breaking. It's important to have a conversation. Traditionally, the water is clear, yellow tinged. If it's thin meconium, it'll have like a light brown to it. Thick meconium's more green. It could have little pieces, particulate meconium. In out of hospital setting, low risk healthy is clear fluid. Thin meconium, you can traditionally still do at home, but once it's thick particulate, you definitely increase the risk of meconium aspiration and delivering in the hospital or extra resources available is a good idea. Some women, the water will break before labor starts, about 10% of women. And there is a time thing. There's two variations of management during labor. You can do expectant management and kind of watch her temperature, risk of infection. Is she GBS positive? Trying to keep your hands out of the vagina to decrease the risk of infection and seeing if she goes into labor on her own. Traditionally in the medical system, it's about six to 12 hours after the water breaks that they try to do an induction and get things going, especially first time mamas that know that they're going to have a longer labor because that's a protective barrier to the baby. So there's active management of labor, there's expectant management of labor, and depending on the rupture, if she's got other infections, she's got a fever, she's got concerns going on, that will help determine if we should get labor going or helping or not. Um, most women honestly start with contractions, the water breaks right before the baby comes out, and then they start getting a good urge to push is what traditionally happens, but never 100%. So the different stages of labor, there's the first stage, second stage, third stage. So the first stage has to do with the latent phase, the early labor, the active, the transition. It's from that zero centimeters to 10 centimeters. Once you know she's in labor, the cervix is changing after every couple hours. It's got a little thinner. It's a little more open. It's a shorter amount of time that you're assessing the labor. The contractions are getting closer and stronger with time. She's getting bloody show. She's getting more pressure. She's getting more uncomfortable with things. That's how you know labor is progressing. Active 
latent labor tends to take the longest, so I give the example of first-time mamas, average labor 24 hours. The first 12 hours is the time when the midwife is traditionally not there. We try to sleep through it, we try to ignore it. They can typically do their daily activities. So the latent phase is milder contractions, they're irregular, they're five to 20 minutes apart. They're consistently getting closer and stronger with time. Active phase is more of that four centimeters all the way to 10 centimeters, and it has subset parts of it. So active phase includes transition. Transition usually happens around seven to eight centimeters. It's the most intense. It tends to be the shortest part of labor. There's just a little bit of cervix left that has a lot of nerve endings before the mom starts pushing. And then when you get to 10 centimeters, you usually start going into the next stage when the woman starts actively pushing, bringing her baby out to the world. That's that second stage. The contractions will consistently get closer, stronger, and more frequent. And eventually they're going to be closer to two to four minutes apart by the time she gets to the second stage. So the second stage is actually birthing the baby. It's actually when the cervix is completely dilated. There's a Ferguson reflex. There's a level in the pelvis where the baby hits that'll actually start a woman's body to involuntarily start pushing her baby out. It's kind of like throwing up. It's totally involuntary. They have no control over it. And rarely do we see that in a hospital setting because they have epidurals. They just tell them as soon as the baby is 10 centimeters dilated, they don't care as much about the stations, the level of where the baby is in the pelvis, and they just to tell the woman to push even if her body isn't quite ready and so that's a very different philosophy of physiological birth versus active management of birth in the community-based setting we tend to see much more natural instinctual pushing occurring in the second stage of labor so the third stage is after the baby came, we're waiting for the placenta. It could take a few minutes. It could be up to 30 minutes. Once you're more than 30 minutes of waiting for a placenta, we always start wondering why. Why isn't it separating the baby skin to skin? She had an uncomplicated delivery. Is there some concerns with the adhesions and the placenta and start worrying about increased risk of postpartum hemorrhage and why the placenta is not separating? So it's usually just, I would say, with delayed cord clamping and checking out her bottom, it's usually five to 10 minutes after the baby is born, the placenta delivers and that third stage of labor is completed. So there's different kinds of childbirth and delivery methods available. We talked about the different routes. We talked about the different, you can choose to see a midwife. You can choose to see an obstetrician. You can choose to see a family practice physician. You can choose to deliver vaginally or C-section. We try to encourage women to pick C-sections if it's a medical reason versus elective, but that's part of living in a wonderful country where you have choices, you have options, and we give you informed consent and you are respected for the choice you make. With a vaginal delivery, the baby is born through the birth canal, normal health healthy term pregnancy is 37 to 42 weeks gestation and that's the range where most women will go into labor and there's just choices there's options you can deliver in the home you can deliver unassisted you can deliver with a midwife you can deliver in the water you can deliver on your bed you can deliver in hands and knees there's a lot of different ways to birth your baby you could choose a birth center you could choose a hospital you could choose pain medicine you could choose to do it natural the whole point of this conversation is just for you to get a good understanding you're newer to this it's a good refresher of what's normal what some of these words mean that we use so regularly but have we really thought about what they actually so a C-section, if she's had a prior C-section, there's medical indication, the rare situation that the baby is too big for the mother's pelvis. We're very grateful we have a cesarean section option in the United States and many developed countries because it kills a lot of moms and babies around the world. It's a big deal to have a balance between respecting our medical community and the resources available to us, but also embracing that birth is normal, healthy process. And when there's variations of normal in emergency situations, we know how to handle them appropriately as midwives and birth workers. Vaginal birth after C-section, we try to get more and more women to do this. It's kind of a controversial topic across the country because very few hospitals are doing it. It's a high litigation thing. It's not cost effective to them. What the insurance companies are paying, they have to have anesthesia in-house, obstetricians in-house. Many midwives in the hospital setting do not do these deliveries, not that they can't, and work with a physician to collaborate because the hospital is requiring the doc to be in-house. So the doc's going to say, well, I'm just going to take over and care of them. I want the revenue from the time and the responsibility. So I'm in an Indian health reservation right now and where there's the TORC Act and there's more limited resources and midwives tend to run the units. 
VBACs, vaginal birth after C-section, trial of labor after C-section is very common for the midwives to manage and take care of. In the home and birth center setting, you always have to think of a lot of different things because there's far less resources. The concern you have is that rare uterine rupture where minutes matter and it can affect the life of a mom and a baby forever. And so we want to make sure we're really doing a thorough assessment and what are their chances of the uterine rupture? Was it a close interval between the delivery Deliveries. Did she have a C-section the first time for breach and she's had three prior C-section or three prior C-sections, she's much higher risk of a uterine rupture versus a woman that's had a breech delivery the first time c-section and then she's had three vaginal deliveries that uterine scar tissue has been tested once they've had a successful vaginal birth after c-section this research shows their risk of uterine rupture is not much different than anyone else it's that trial right after the c-section that has that questionable and, and should you be doing a vaginal birth after c-section after one two three c-sections there's just not a ton of data out there of the true risk and benefits after that first c-section and so i hear variations of normal all over the country for birth centers and home birth practices nationally speaking particularly with birth center standards if your facility your birthing location is within 30 minutes of an emergency service labor and delivery can handle an emergency she's had one prior c-section low transverse not a classical incision certain good indicators it wasn't for pushed for four hours and it was a five, six pound baby, you always wonder, okay, is it her pelvis? Is it something that the C-section was the best route or was it a non-reassuring heart tone, something totally irrelevant to that baby and it was an emergency and we're grateful we have it, but it didn't have anything to do with the adequacy of her, her pelvis and the potential future of having a successful vaginal delivery. So these are more assisted delivery methods in an emergency situation in the hospital setting. They're not used in the community-based birth setting. A vacuum extraction is like a suction cup that they put over the top of the baby's head. There's obviously risk and benefits to every option you choose. It's not, these two options are not part of routine vaginal deliveries. They're used in emergency situations. The baby is so close to coming out, particularly first-time mamas. I would say for multi, multi-gravita women that have had babies, before you can say hey your baby's heart tones are low you're starting to have some extra bleeding we need to get your baby out now they will find the way to get their baby out now first time moms the tissues never been stretched before it's a lot harder to give them that guided direction and so vacuum extraction is to help when the baby is close to delivering and there's a few contractions left but you need to get baby out now for an emergency situation Forcep deliveries, I'm seeing those less and less. It's really based on the training of the residency and the physicians in a local area. Vacuums tend to be the more common use. Midwives can get special privileges to do vacuums, but most of them prefer to just call their collaborating physician. But I promise you, if you're in a low resource area and minutes matter, you will grab that vacuum and you will help that baby out because you know their heart rate, their cord is being kinked for one reason or another. They're bleeding, there's a placenta abruption, there's a cord that got broken. We need to get the baby out now and make sure that the baby is safe. So forcep delivery, they look like big giant salad tongue. They cause a lot more trauma to the mother with tears than they actually do to the baby. And there's an art to them. You have to be, I mean, I've never seen a midwife do the forceps. And to me, it just seems far more barbaric than doing the vacuum. So it, it really has to do with the cultural norms and the style of the local hospital organizations. But it's the same key concept. The baby is stressed out. We need to get the baby out right away. So these are the stages of labor. We've already reviewed them. The first stage is that latent, the initial stage, early labor, that first 12 hours on a first time mama, where things are just going to that first five centimeters. Things are thinning. The contractions are every five to 20 minutes apart. And then as you notice with the active phase, the baby's a little lower in the pelvis. The cervix has thinned out, effaced a little bit more. Things are starting to open. The mom's feeling more pelvic pressure. Transition, you can notice that the cervix is almost all gone. There's seven to eight centimeters centimeters there's just a little bit around the baby's head it tends to be the most intense part of the contractions they're short they're on top of each other this is when they get nauseous this is when they tend to say I want to go to the hospital for an epidural and pain management because the transition is the pits it can last 20 minutes it can last a couple hours everybody is different 
when they've had a baby before, it tends to be a pretty quick transition from transition to pushing. And then the second stage, as you can see, that's when delivery is actually happening. There's no cervix left. The baby is actually coming through the birth canal. This baby is in an anterior presentation. So posterior would be the sunny side up. The baby's rotated. And they're harder to push out when they're posterior because it's a larger angle of the baby's head going through the birth canal. So asynclitic is another word I use. It's where the baby's head is a little cockeyed, it's a little off to the side, you're getting like a, an odd angle of the baby's head coming out. So the second stage is when they start pushing to when the burp baby comes out and then the third stage as you can see the baby is already out the cord has been cut we're waiting for the placenta to separate that was the lifeline to the baby while it was growing inside its mother it could take five minutes it could take up to 30 minutes and you'll see signs of separation the mom will start feeling some cramping that's another benefit if they don't have pain meds if they have an epidural you have to be much more aggressive in interventions assessment tools because the mom doesn't have the sensations to describe to us when she's having the contractions the feelings she's having so that's another other benefit community-based midwives have. So she'll start cramping, there'll be signs of separation, there'll be some bleeding, the cord will start to slide out of the vagina a little bit, and so the placenta is ready to deliver. So inductional labor, this isn't something traditionally at a hospital midwives worry about or deal with, but if you're in the hospital setting or you have a lady that is a, needing an induction for a medical reason in the hospital setting, it's nice for the midwives to have a good sense of what are the different options for induction, depending on the risk for mom and baby, the situation, is it for preterm labor, is it for post dates, her bishop score, how ready her cervix is to deliver a baby, how thin it is, how open, how soft the position there's actual algorithms to give you the statistics of the success rate based on how ready her body is. So you have to, as a midwife, it's not that you have to know the ins and outs, but giving them a high level education of, okay, your cervix, I just checked you, your cervix is closed, thick and high. It's gonna take some time to have an induction. Your body is not quite ready. They're gonna give you some medicine to help soften the cervix. They can give it to you vaginally. They can give it to you orally. It's typically Cytotec, Cervidil. It's a prostaglandin to help stimulate the, the softening of the cervix. Maybe they're gonna do, your cervix is thin, in, it's open, you're three centimeters or four centimeters. They'll consider doing some IV infusion of oxytocin, pitocin, man-made drug to help actually make contractions. There could be Foley bulbs, which are used to kind of thin and mechanically dilate the cervix. In, you can use it in conjunction with prostaglandins. You can use it in conjunction with oxytocins. Every facility across the country does things slightly different. Some women, their cervix is four centimeters. There's a bulging bag of water. She's already starting to contract a little bit. Some women literally just need their water broken to get them into labor and so always thinking about as a midwife a physician in the hospital setting we want to do the least amount of intervention to have the highest success rate and so if a woman has a poor bishop score we're gonna have to do a lot more interventions and a longer induction process than a woman that's had a baby before and her body is very close to going into labor on its own so there's different pain management options to utilize during labor. There's the non-medicated pain management options. There's water therapy, meditations, relaxation techniques, breathing techniques, touch, effleurage, hot heat, warm compresses, cool washcloths, massage, distractions, imagery. They can look pictures of their baby. They could do the lotus burst. They could do hypnosis. There's a lot of positioning, really changing the angle of the pelvis and the baby and constantly moving and finding better positions, rubbing the lower back. Everybody is different, but water therapy tends to be a real favorite in the out-of-hospital community. And then traditional options in the hospital setting, just more so you're aware of the different choices available. You can have anesthesias, which is more of small amounts. They're IV. It could be Stadol. It could be fentanyl. It could be Nubane. There's so many different variations across the country. And some will give two doses. Some will give up to six doses. And some will only do it an hour apart. Some will do it three hours apart. There's a wide variation of these medications. They're traditionally given in the IV. And they're used to cut the edge off the pain, make women feel drowsy, sleepy. The first one tends to be the most effective they're in the earlier labor it's the first time they've had the medication the more doses they get it tends to not work as well babies tend to get sleepy on the monitor they're going to be on continuous monitoring with inductions pain management any complications of labor they're going to keep a close eye on the baby and the mom 
Anesthesia tends to be pudendal blocks, local nerve ending blocks, epidurals, spinals, general anesthesia. Epidurals are very common across the United States. It's a very popular option because it tends to give the most pain relief, longer standing time. They can have a pump, they can have buttons. It tends to make women the most numb and they're not active and moving around. They have to have the most interventions with them. They have to have a Foley. They have to be repositioned. Their legs are numb. There's goods and bads to all these options. If there's an emergency situation for a C-section, that tube stays in the mom's back till after birth and they can give the medicine through it. A general anesthesia spinal is more with C-sections. If it's an emergency and they can't give them medicine in the back and they need to put them to sleep. The main ones for pain management, I would say, are the Nubane, the Stadol, and the Epidurals would be the most common across the country. So we talked about the labor contractions. We've reviewed it over and over again. Everybody is different. What are labor contractions? They are high feeling tightness in the belly. They're low in their super pubic bone. They're in their back. They're in their butt. Like I've heard every description of when they get a contraction, that contraction, if it's true labor, is bringing the baby down in the birth canal. If they're Braxton Hicks contractions, their practice contractions, they could be caused from many different things. Everybody worries about the baby coming early or is this the early signs of labor. She may have had sex. She may have a pelvic infection. She may have yeast, BV, a bacterial vaginosis. She may have a bladder infection. She may have dehydration. She had too much activity. She's stressed about something. She slipped and fell on her belly. That uterus is a giant muscle and it can get tired and it can tighten for many different reasons. So our job as a midwife and healthcare providers is to assess, are these labor contractions? Are these Braxton Hicks? What are the different things that could be causing them? How is she describing it? What are some things we can do to see if they get better or worse with time? Everybody describes them differently. Some people say they're just mild menstrual cramps. Some women say they're the worst thing in the world. Some people, it just depends on your perception, the stages of labor, your past experience with birth. If it's a first time mom and she's nervous and scared, you're gonna be more tense. The more tension you have during the labor process, the more the pain receptors and the, the longer the birth process is. So the whole point with the labor is to help relax them, help ride the waves of the contractions, change. I mean, Ina May uses surges. You can change the wording because your whole thing is it's half a mind game and it's half of what the body is actually doing. So this is a common question we get asked as midwives and birth workers for moms that have never had a baby before. How do you actually time contractions? Contractions are timed from the beginning of one contraction to the beginning of the next contraction. They can be irregular, but in time they tend to get closer and stronger if it's truly labor. So there's apps out there. I always stress to people, if you do the apps and you analyze every single contraction, you're never, it's gonna take you forever to get into labor because you're thinking too much. You're analyzing things. You need to just let go and give generalized, just generalized updates. I always get more nervous for those first time moms that send me the last six hours of contraction apps because I'm like, this is going to be a long, hard labor because she's overanalyzing everything. We need to just let go and trust our bodies and give averages. Okay, the last couple hours, they've went from about 10 minutes apart to six minutes apart. It's not perfect science, but just giving generalized sense. The easiest way, some people will use an app, they'll use a piece of paper, especially first time parents. The dad can do this, the mom can just do her thing. Like she does not, she needs to put her guard down, do her thing. The dad can see when she start moaning, when her belly tightens up, he puts his hand, she starts repositioning. He can tell when the contractions are starting and then that's the time. And so you, this is great for partners, for support teams to help with communicating to the midwife when it's a good time to come or it's a time to go to the hospital. Everybody's different what contractions feel like. Some people call it as rectal pressure, rectal pain, gas pain, belly tightening, lower abdominal, pelvic, everybody's different. Back, just depending on baby's position, your personal history, if you've had a back injury, you've had certain situations happen, it will have impact your nerve endings and how you perceive labor. So the strengths of the contractions will traditionally increase as time goes on. Um, they're going to start out milder. The belly is softer. A little cue that I always give to help out moms and newer birth workers to tell the gauge of if a contraction by touching the top of her belly is mild, 
moderate or strong is comparing it to touching your face. So if you touch her belly and she's in a contraction and it's kind of like you're pressing on your nose, that's more of a mild contraction. If you're pressing on her belly, just light pressure to feel that muscle tightening and it's more like the chin, that's more of moderate contractions. If it's like touching your forehead, it's that similar sensation, those are stronger contractions. So that's a good way for families to relate. If they're trying to gauge is this strong, especially first time moms, they don't have anything to compare to. They don't know what is coming in the future. I mean, I hear it so many times. These are strong contractions and they're coming all the time. The midwife goes and assesses and they're not all the time. They're only comparing the breaks they're getting. Maybe they're longer contractions and they're every seven to 10 minutes apart, but they're only getting a break of a minute to two minutes. The touching their belly, it's nice and soft, but they're describing them as intense already. So it's our responsibility to be honest and gentle with, you know, I know you're describing and these feel strong to you, but this is the earlier labor. These are still milder ones. We need to help you cope with this. We need to help because you've got some stronger ones coming ahead and we've got a long ways to go with this labor process. So just as an overall conclusion summary, I just wanted birth workers, assistants, doulas, new midwives, aspiring midwives to go back to the basics. What exactly is labor? What are the changes happening? What are the things to look for? What are the options during the birthing process for the different setting, the providers, the birth stages? But there's no hard rule of this is when labor started. It's more subjective. I tend to leave it up to the moms. When do you think your labor started? Because it's her birth story. It's her, it doesn't matter it started at 8.15 versus 9.15. In the bigger picture, no. It's our job to empower and to support a normal birth process, but being available for variations of normal and being available and having the skills for emergencies and knowing this is a sign of normal labor. This is a sign of concern that we should be going to the hospital. We should be checking things out more. We should be doing additional assessments and knowing what are all the different pain management options that are available in the natural birthing community plus in the hospital setting. Epidurals are very popular across the country. There's also IV pain medicine, water therapy, repositioning, aromatherapies, noise, dimmed lights, calming environments. We want to allow the women to instinctually birth as much as possible. Take care of.